Um, immediately following tonight's talk, we'll hold the book signing downstairs in the library. And our next cottage conversation is April 25th with the Honorable Frank Williams, editor of the recently published Mary Lincoln Enigma, Historians on America's Most Controversial First Lady. We are also thrilled to announce a new partnership with Lincoln, the restaurant here in downtown DC. The restaurant will be donating a percentage of their proceeds on April 16th to the cottage to support our programs and preservation. Lincoln, the restaurant is called Lincoln. This is on Vermont Avenue, which is along Lincoln's historic commute route between the cottage and the city. And uh, if you've ever, if you've never been there, one of the really neat uh, aspects of the interior decor is that the floor is entirely covered in pennies. Oh. And, and several of the staff here have been and can vouch for how wonderful and tasty the food is, so I encourage you all to go on April 16th <laughs> um, to help us celebrate DC Emancipation Day. Um, to learn more about that, you can visit our website, WinkingCottage.org, or get in touch with um, people on staff, including John Davison, our Associate Director for Development, and Hilary Melson, who is our Marketing and Membership Coordinator back here in the room. I've asked Scott Ackerman to introduce Professor Oakes tonight, since Dr. Oakes will be directing Scott's thesis research. <laughs> Scott has been a member of our team since, <laughs> Scott's been a member of our team since 2008, but he was recently accepted to the City, City University of New York, where he will complete his doctoral work. His thesis will look at the question of what union meant to the Civil War generation in a community, examining multiple meanings of loyalty, dissent, and treason. We will miss you, Scott, but we could be more excited for you, and no pressure within a few years. I expect you to publish a book that will land you back here at the conference. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Scott. Well, if there was ever a time to get all of your information and facts right for me, this is definitely <laughs> James Oates received his doctorate in American history from the University of California at Berkeley. He's taught at Princeton and Northwestern. Currently, he's Distinguished Professor of History and Graduate School Humanities Professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center. He's the author of many critically acclaimed books on slavery and the Civil War, including Slavery and Freedom and Interpretation of the Old South, The Ruling Race, The History of American Slaveholders, The Radical and the Republican, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and the Triumph of Anti-Slavery Politics, which was awarded the Lincoln Prize in 2008. His most recent work, Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States Between 1861 and 1865, has also been awarded the Lincoln Prize for 2013. In Freedom National, Professor Oakes traces the development of anti-slavery policy from its pre-war origins to the ratification of the 13th Amendment in 1865. Among the many implications of Oakes' work, and there are many, perhaps the most provocative is that Freedom National forces us to reconsider the familiar aims of the Civil War as shifting from preservation of the Union to emancipation. Indeed, Oakes writes that while Republicans believe the Constitution did not allow them to wage war for any other purpose other than the restoration of the Union, they also insisted that slavery was the cause of the rebellion, and as such, emancipation was an, was an appropriate and indispensable means of suppressing it. Thus, in Oakes' estimation, Republicans never had to move from union to emancipation because those two issues, liberty and union, were never separate for them. To say that Freedom National has sparked some controversy is both an understatement <laughs> and a compliment to the breadth and scope of the scholarship in this work. Undoubtedly, it is the best work we now have on the process of emancipation. It will definitely impact the way we tell the story of Lincoln and emancipation here at President Lincoln's Cottage. It is my honor and privilege to present Dr. James O. Coming. I gave a talk last week at a, uh, at a place in Manhattan called the Society Library. Anybody here? Mm -hmm. The New York Society Library? Mm -hmm. oh, I, I was embarrassed to say at the outset that having been born and raised in New York, uh, 
having passed the library a million times, I had never actually been in it. I have to repeat the same thing right now. I, I've never been in this building before tonight, and it's a delight to be here. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and I, I thank you all for coming. This is uh, the book, as you can see. It's, it's very big. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't easy to get it down to a 45 or 50 minute lecture, so you'll have to apologize me if I uh, speak at New York uh, speed. <laughs> there was great excitement among the slaves on Charles Hayes' plantation, 16 miles from Louisville, when they heard the news that Abraham Lincoln had issued an Emancipation Proclamation a few days before. It was early January of 1863, and a number of Union men passing by the Hayes Plantation, quote, inquired of the slaves if their master had set them free. Fearing he would be arrested if he failed to let his slaves know of their freedom, Hayes appeared one morning as the slaves were eating their breakfast. In a nervous, uneasy manner, he made the announcement, quote, men and women hear me, I am about to tell you something I never expected to be obliged to tell you in all my life, and it is this. It becomes my duty to inform you, one and all, women, men, and children belonging to me, you are free to go as you please. Hayes then cursed Lincoln, quote, for taking all you Negroes away from me. <laughs> A great jubilee commenced on the plantation. Uh, Excuse me, among, uh, but old Massa got drunk and skulked off to his room while the slaves were, quote, cheering Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Bless the Lord, and Bess exclaimed, my children are all free. It's an interesting story in its own right, and it helps us appreciate one of the many ways in which the slaves were freed during the Civil War. But I want to make a different point about the story, and that is, if you ever hear someone say that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free a single slave, Think of Charles Hayes cursing Abraham Lincoln back in January of 1863. But let's move ahead to March 29, 1864, and listen to a different kind of speech. This one given by Senator Lyman Trumbull as he reported the 13th Amendment, the one abolishing slavery, out of his Judiciary Committee. Why do we need such an amendment, Trumbull asked. Because the Emancipation Proclamation was not enough, he answered. Trumbull cited the critics who claimed that at best Lincoln's proclamation applied only to slaves who were actually physically freed during the war, like the slaves on Charles Hayes' plantation. Trumbull wasn't sure the critics were right, but he could not be sure they were wrong either. This was a serious problem because most slaves uh, in the Confederate states were not, as Lincoln put it, practically or in practice, freed by the war. And when the war ended, emancipation would stop. And what about the slaves of loyal masters on lo in loyal slave states? The Emancipation Proclamation didn't free them either, Trumbull pointed out. And even if Lincoln's proclamation had freed them, Trumbull admitted, what was to stop the southern states from re-enslaving them when the war was over? Freedom was national, Republicans believed, whereas slavery was merely local. It was a state institution. And when peace was restored, the power over slavery would revert to the states. <clears throat> For all of those reasons and more, Trumbull argued, we must have a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery. Trumbull's speech lacks the human drama of Charles Hayes' announcement of emancipation to his slaves, but it suggests an equally important lesson. When you hear someone say that in affixing his signature to the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln freed all the slaves, quote, with the stroke of his pen. Think of Senator Lyman Trumbull desperately imploring his colleagues to pass the 13th Amendment, because if they didn't, the war would end without slavery having been abolished in most of the South. We oversimplify the Emancipation Proclamation. It didn't free a single slave. It freed all the slaves. We shroud the document in myths. We conjure up myths about Abraham Lincoln to explain our myths about his proclamation. He was a reluctant emancipator. That's why he didn't free any slaves. He was the great emancipator who freed all the slaves. And this mythology, all of it, was as popular back then as it is today. It was already in place, publicly debated, 
even before Lincoln issued the proclamation. We are blinded by these myths, we always have been, so much so that even now, 150 years later, we cannot answer the simplest but most important question, what did the Emancipation Proclamation actually do? The mythology of the proclamation had a lot to do with its timing. Lincoln issued it on January 1st, 1863, nearly 20 months after the war started, thereby raising the question, what took him so long? In the summer of 1862, when people first began asking, tried to answer that question, they usually resorted to idle speculations. They drew inferences based on ignorance of what Lincoln was up to. It didn't take long for these speculations and inferences to harden into myths, or rather into two myths, one of them pro-Lincoln and the other anti-Lincoln. Horace Greeley may be taken as the spokesman for, if not the godfather, of the anti-Lincoln myth. <clears throat> Greeley was the opinionated editor of the New York Tribune, one of the most influential papers in, New in the United States. In August of 1862, Greeley published a famous editorial called The Prayer of Twenty Millions. The 20 million referred to the number of people living in the northern states, and what they were all praying for, according to Greeley, was emancipation. Greeley demanded that the president, quote, enforce the law, specifically the emancipation provisions of the Second Confiscation Act that Lincoln had signed a month earlier on July 17, 1862. Those provisions would not take full effect until the president issued a proclamation. Everyone assumed that Lincoln would issue it shortly after he signed the bill. And in fact, he came here the following weekend and drafted the proclamation in this, in this episode. But he didn't issue it. And after three or four weeks, Greeley was losing his patience. <coughs> Why the delay? Yeah. And in his answer, he concocted one of those enduring myths that I mentioned earlier. Lincoln was taking so long, Greeley wrote, because in his heart of hearts, Lincoln didn't really want to free the slaves. Start, from the start of the war, Lincoln had resisted every effort to undermine slavery. Look at the record, really urged. Lincoln came into office in March of 1861, vowing not to interfere with slavery in the states where it already existed. In September, he overturned the proclamation issued by General John C. Fremont that would have freed the slaves of all the rebels in Missouri. In May of 1862, Lincoln overturned another order, General David Hunter's edict abolishing slavery in Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. A few months later, after Lincoln, near, after Lincoln, a few months later, Lincoln nearly threw the national government into a turmoil by threatening to veto the Second Confiscation Act, the very law that would free slaves as soon as Lincoln issued his proclamation. And now, a month later, the nation sits and waits for Lincoln to implement a statute he never wanted to sign to begin with. In Greeley's telling, Lincoln was a most reluctant emancipator. He took so long to issue the Emancipation Proclamation because he never wanted to issue it, and when he finally did issue it, Lincoln did so not for lofty moral reasons, not because slavery was wrong, but because the destruction of slavery had become what Lincoln called a military necessity. To this day, skeptics cite the same litany Greeley did, use the same reasoning, come to the same conclusion. It took 20 months to issue the proclamation because Lincoln was reluctant to make emancipation a legitimate goal of the war, and finally did so only to deprive the rebels of their slaves in order to win the war. 